introduce the evening. I'm happy to call Ms. Bevin, the provost, that's the uh, first of the vice presidents of the California Institute of Integral Studies. Some of you heard today talking about integral education. <laughs> Thank you. So, actually, on behalf of California Institute of Integral Studies, I don't like acronyms, although I use them. Um, <laughs> I would like to gather us all here and welcome us for this now closing of what I think has been a really important three days. I unfortunately missed yesterday, have been here all day today and had the feel of it on Friday. Um, but with many thanks to those de led by Debashish who organized this gathering and this remarkable synchronicity between two places, two different continents, uh, with this um, mission starting in 1968 to bring a certain way of thinking, being, observing into the world, into fruition. And um, I remarked uh, during the break that I think one of the really important things of this gathering is to do with the roots of California Institute of Integral Studies. And that this deep root that obviously has a lot of parallels uh, going back be well before 1968 needs to be nurtured and nourished. And my sense is that this weekend has provided nourishment for the very root of this institution and its important work. And for that, I am personally deeply grateful because we can take such things for granted. And I am quite sure that the bathing of the root that has happened during these conversations and presentations will now echo into the future in many ways that we can't yet see. And it's quite remarkable now that we're going to finish the evening with a conversation of two people who, whose lives have crossed and intersected for many, many years, who I've just witnessed can have a passionate argument about a topic at the drop of the hat, <laughs> and who are now going to pick up two, uh, two institutions known in Northern California and throughout the world, this one and Esalen, Dr. Robert McDermott and Michael Murphy, in dialogue, perhaps about these roots and how we got here and where we're going. So thank you both and a warm welcome and many, many thanks to all of you from this institution for the gift that I know will radiate into our future. That's the provost for having. Yeah. Uh, all right, so Mike was going first, but um, I'm gonna say a word or two about him. Michael been, was with Haridas and Bina in the early 60s. He was before that, he was a student of Frederick Spiegelberg. He went to the Street Oriental Ashram in the 50s. Um, he and CIS and uh, the Oriental Ashram have been entwined for more than half, half a century. And I just may add it when uh, Vina told Michael to call me to get out of here and interview to be president in 1990. And it was because I couldn't say no to Michael that we're here together. All right. he, oh, he, he also served Oroville. Sorry? He also served Oroville. Oh, please. At the please. International Advisory Council. Let, let uh, Michael say a word about that. Yeah, uh, 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 twice. Uh, twice. Uh, <coughs> I was over there on the International Advisory Council, which uh, Julian has just informed me is no longer in existence. Where are you, Julian? Is that true? After you, what do they do? <laughs> That's because you didn't need it. He fixed all the, all the, all the, all the leaky points. Yeah. So, you're on. Good luck. OK. OK. Um, actually, I met Ari Das in 1951. And um, before I went to the Arbindo Ashram uh, in 56, 57, uh, I was a um, junior at Stanford. Um, Frederick Spiegelberg was um, <coughs> organizing the American Academy of Asian Studies. How many of you know about uh, know that history? Because, um, okay, because uh, Liz, I'm going to really take the beat. I mean, uh, this is about the roots. Yes. Um, because uh, these are uh, quite uh, marvelous roots. And um, 
also we were uh, both organizations, ESWA and CIS, were born uh, out of um, a vision uh, of, of both the, the content of the program and the basic structure. That's a, a, a point I want to make, and I think we can explore it. Um, uh, so, uh, in any case, um, so I knew Hari Das from 51 to 75, and um, Hari Das and I and my wife Dulcie had a date for dinner uh, the night he died. So he had sent me uh, that I got on the day he died a catalog of the cities that he had put together spontaneously um, when I asked him. Uh, to, to do to, to do such a thing, and um, and when I asked him uh, how he did it, he said, "Well, growing up in Calcutta, where I did, at that time it was all in the air, so he could reel off this about 400 separate cities, uh, the supernormal powers that arise in the practice of yoga, that are uh, rejected by many ascetic traditions." Uh, as kind of below uh, the, um, the major aims of the practice, uh, often in a worldview that said uh, the aim is to uh, get out of this fallen place, this world of maya, uh, this wheel of samsara, and go upstairs. And um, <laughs> the cities uh, do, do relate to, to the tantra, I would argue, more and more professors are into this. The new chairman at Esalen Institute, Jeff Kripal, whose first book is about Ramakrishna, got him in a lot of trouble in India with the Vindupa crowd and who wanted to uh, do him in uh, for um, talking about Ramakrishna as if he was an actual human and uh, so forth. But in any case, uh, made the point that um, it, uh, the tantric element of Ramakrishna's background is underappreciated. And by Tantra we mean uh, a meta theory that has traveled from India all over Asia. It's not these uh, weekend, uh, uh, you know, what, Maithuna exercises, you know, kind of this romantic uh, uh, new age, uh, you know, copulation that Tantra <laughs> is a vast body of witness and uh, lore. So uh, Hari Das was well acquainted with this, and um, talk, uh, Hari Das said to me that Aurobindo um, at one point um, decided to put a Vedantic gloss when he started to write uh, and emphasize that rather than the, than the Tantra. But in any case, um, uh, so coming back to me and uh, Hari Das, um, 24 years of conversation. Um, so he never said to me what his boot print was for CIS, but we talked a lot about the things he wanted. First, um, to go for into those domains that were open, opened up for him, mainly by Aurobindo, and for me, largely by Sri Aurobindo. The undiscovered country, of our greater human nature. Uh, he, like I, was influenced by William James, um, and I think indirectly by Frederick Myers and the, the British Society of Psychical Research. They were providing all this new language and this uh, scientific uh, attitude uh, to explore into uh, the undiscovered nature of our higher nature. And, um, but, um, also, that Arbindo had given enough shape to the kind of practices that you would need. And uh, the word of Purna Yoga, which Haridas, I think, coined. Wow. Yeah, I, I think, I don't know if anybody can say for sure. He, no, he didn't invent the term Purna, which uh, there's been an argument over exactly what you mean by Purna. Peter Hees and I have talked quite a bit about it. I know Devashish would know more about the fullness of being. But it gets translated as integral yoga. Yeah. Purnadvaita Vedanta is, is it? Purnadvaita Vedanta is a Haridas Chaudhary coinage. Yeah, aha. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Purna Yoga, Sri Aurobindo already used. But, but Purnadvaita Vedanta is a. Well, that was his coinage. 
Wow. Well, there it is. And, um, <laughs> um, and there it is. And, um, see, we're, we're into discovery already here. Yes, sir. Um, <laughs> well, thank you. Um, the, um, well, and that's been very important and excellent. Now, uh, this would be interesting tonight. Uh, out of the big vision, and that's something we always get, the big vision, which uh, would be an evolutionary panentheism. People say, well, is there a name for your lineage? I, I've always gotten that. And um, now this is something that we, there might be some disagreements in here. I never wanted to say that we were in the Aurobindo lineage at Esla. Uh, I myself, I, in the earliest years, I would say I'm neo Aurobindonian. Uh, but, I was, uh, but it was um, uh, because I. Um, Anyway, this is another subject, but um, the uh, but the other subject. I warn you. Yeah, but there are but the, the fundamental um, game plan, the floor plan, uh, was came straight out of our vendor for me and for Horatius. So, but with that plan uh, come entailments. In other words, if you're going to do that, certain things uh, are valorized as a fancy term or given more value, starting with the cities, uh, and uh, implicit in that is that all our human nature is flowering with higher versions of themselves. Every human attribute. My most ambitious book, The Future of the Body, it was a, you know, 3,000 footnotes. It uh, <laughs> came out of 10,000 studies we collected, uh, yeah, which you can, anybody can access through the SN website now. They're all word coded. You want to find out about Muslim stigmata as opposed to Christian stigmata? You can do that if you're interested in that. <laughs> but um, in any case, um, so um, uh, that fullness of being uh, uh, is entailed by this, and um, it does um, when you um, make this move. And what I feel when Haridas started CIS, when I started Eslin, uh, we uh, inherited a kind of DNA which, if followed, uh, is the hottest game in town. <laughs> Let me just say that. What? But what you betray leads one far into tulip fields that uh, don't really need to be explored. And uh, I, so it's a um, richly beguiling DNA. And uh, <clears throat> Uh, and what I've seen uh, again and again that both Essel and CIS is wandering off the dark, okay? Um, and um, so that's one thing uh, to talk about. So what are some of the principles? Okay, first, that, uh, well, evolution is a fact, you know? And you'd be surprised how many people, I mean, <laughs> Houston Smith, for example, yeah. was still arguing that evolution was not proven yet. <clears throat> well, you know, well, so that's, it's, a, it's an unworthy conversation. Uh, evolution <laughs> is a fact, all right? Uh, evolution is far more complex than a simple Darwinian uh, uh, assertion. Okay, the world is going somewhere. There's an arrow in time. Uh, we are developing. And since you and I share this impulse, we're actually developing. I mean, we don't take time out. Uh, some of us go backwards to this or that part of our being, perhaps. But nevertheless, there's this great urge for development, evolution. And we, in that, we share the central adventure of the cosmos itself. Okay, secondly, obviously, these are the, the most basic things, is what William James called the more, the transcendent order that resists naming. And you could argue that the Indian tradition has been better about hanging loose about the particular names than some of our Judeo-Christian uh, brethren, or in other words, uh, the, the naming. And uh, I am a jealous guy, but um, in, uh, in India it was, you know, naming is only part of the recognition. In other words, this is a vast, undiscovered country. <clears throat> a third uh, principle that we inherit is that something in us is identical with that ultimate something. Atman is Brahman, is uh, <clears throat> but spelled out. Um, you get through reading Sri Aurobindo and you've got to supplement Atman is Brahman with a lot of other 
the things. But uh, nevertheless, that is essential. Okay, when it comes uh, now to actually structuring an organization. Now, I never talked to Hari Das about a, a blueprint. I didn't have a blueprint. I don't think he had a blueprint for CIS. But what we had is a, a commitment that we are <coughs> exploring into this territory. Um, uh, it's an adventure. There are a lot of things that he could say, I could say, most of the world could say that this is a fact. I mean, I would say that Akbar is a Brahman is a statement of fact. A lot of people wouldn't, of course. But, but a lot is unknown. So it was in the spirit of exploration, and so the general model was that we were um, not a national, um, and we were um, not a community with a capital C. Now, I would say that this is a difference with Oroville, which is an attempt to uh, build a community in the light of, well, the mother's vision, and, uh, uh, but Esalen and CIS are not. Uh, the, the model that I think we'd have to say uh, is more like a college, uh, uh, with, a, with faculty, uh, and we honor uh, dialogue, we honor arguments, we are an institution of higher, uh, okay. a mission says, yes, yeah. we are an institution of higher education. Um, I haven't said this in some time. <laughs> uh, uh, it's coming, it's coming. Institution of higher education, uh, which uh, fosters uh, intellect, uh, wisdom, and spirit in service of um, the cosmos, humanity, and the individual. Yeah. Wow. Okay. That's not exact. But it is an answer to your yeah. to your hesitation. It is not an ashram, and he didn't want it to be an ashram. He wanted it to be an accredited uh, school. Uh, he didn't start the undergraduate program. We did, but he was creating a a graduate school. Right. But there were markers for Haridas and for, for me, it doesn't, that make it different than Stanford or Harvard. For sure. Okay. Um, Aldous Huxley gave us some of the language, the, the nonverbal humanities. That's a good phrase that <laughs> Huxley used. Uh, in other words, we're going to um, um, not only really talk about meditation, but have meditation teachers. We're not going to just talk about the body. We're going to invite uh, the many somatics teachers. This is a blossoming new set of yogas that is uh, coming out of the West, mainly. Don Johnson has been a central figure. Some people would say he's the dean of the field. Uh, yeah, he's generally regarded as that, but he's been central to um, Esalen's um, uh, nurturing of things like Rolf, Fien, Feldenkrais. I mean, there's dozens of these new uh, transformative practices that focus on the body. Now, again, this is very interesting in our window. The tremendous emphasis of the, the body in the yoga. Know, they had quite a sports program at the ashram, and you know I've written these books on sport, and so uh, it's a great way for uh, for me to um, you know to um, uh, uh, <coughs> do something I love very much. I, I noticed, you know, <laughs> yeah, and, and even get the IRS to write off my expenses as research. <laughs> 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 we applaud this. That's funny to that. It'll be better. Yeah, yeah. Michael, say a word about oh. Shiva Sarans. Yeah, well, okay. But uh, that, I think that will lead us to a story. Okay. Because I'm going to try to finish in a couple of minutes. Oh, good. Yeah. So, okay, the nonverbal <laughs> humanities. And what, it, what I think we gave ourselves room to uh, go into these territories and all the sorts of programs at both places. Uh, and often getting people from Stanford and Harvard to, down to Esla involved with us uh, uh, to go in that direction. Uh, that you're not going to get, you know, getting your BA or your PhD at those schools. Um, so um, we could go on now on the um, founding principles without which uh, the, play, the place loses uh, some of its uh, vital organs. Okay. So some of us have been worrying and talking about this at California Institute of Medical Studies for a long time, and we're at a moment of some pretty intense anxiety about it. Could you say a word about how you've kept 
a mission at Esalen. I remember years ago you saying that how many different groups or ideologies tried to steal the bacon or steal the tofu, <laughs> capture, 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 capture the flag, capture the flag yeah. or steal the tofu, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> how do you hold them? And, yeah. Well, okay, it's one thing. Uh, I mean, there is um, uh, it, powerful leaders often have a uh, dynamic to, uh, to bring everything into their orbit. They're so passionate about what it is. And uh, we have to say there's a lot of just uh, priming, uh, you know, money behavior. I mean, in the whole thing. It's still in a lot of leaders. It's this uh, dominant. So we've, uh, that's, uh, Dick Bryce and I agreed. We're not going to let anyone capture the flag. Fritz Perls came the closest, uh, partly by that he lived there for five years. He uh, had a wicked genius. He, I mean, he could look at you and uh, uh, see things, and then he would tell you what he saw, and uh, whether you wanted to hear or not. And um, so um, um, he had a huge influence, uh, but uh, eventually that's kind of been assimilated into the, into the place. And uh, uh, in um, and for that reason, he left uh, after five years. Uh, and he wanted to, as he, <coughs> he wanted to make it a shot of the woods, and uh, he said. So, uh, <coughs> and uh, uh, four or five people have been a strong run at Esalen to bring it into this or that orbit. So to keep it open has been, um, uh, you have to actively manage these places because strong personalities come in and the influence pretty soon it gets away from you. Uh, and it can operate, uh, it has operated for us, not only at the level of uh, the leaders who are doing the programs, but on the board of trustees itself, where you have a very dominant um, trustee who uh, can be very, very generous, uh, uh, often a very successful business person, and um, they have succeeded in business, and they want to succeed now in yogi practice or intellectual clarifications or whatever. So uh, keeping the system open was very important, and uh, that was certainly uh, important for our guys. But keep the system open, but at the same time aimed in a particular direction that isn't open to any old direction. Um, and because you and I both know that the amazing fact about Lawrence Rockefeller is that he didn't insist on any particular okay. program or yeah. uh, whatever else. Yeah, we were lucky to. Uh, we were lucky, you were lucky. Um, yeah. Now, it's, the CIS is slightly different, and I want to introduce the idea of Oroville. In that, um, we have, in addition to a board and who oversees the president, we have a faculty. Yeah. And faculty has a capacity to fire the president. Not according to any statement, but in fact, if the faculty votes, no confidence becomes really difficult for the president to survive and to board gets aware of this. Yeah. Now, uh, uh, Oroville, as many people here know so well, and you know from your work, um, of course, had the, not just a, uh, a founder leader, but a um, preeminent spiritual teacher at the highest level. Um, so there's a drop after that. So have you, in your years at Oroville uh, Board, what did you learn about uh, transmission of authority and uh, well, I, you know, I, you know, I was only there twice, um, uh, you know, for a month each time, um, oh, in, a, 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 as a member of the board, yeah, yeah. And, and not so many years ago. Um, so I, um, I don't know if I'm really competent to describe the um, politics, but I was aware, very strongly aware of the. Uh, um, uh, I mean, to be human is to necessarily, if you're in an organization, to be political. And there were strong feelings uh, about, about a lot of things, about the building programs. I mean, um, uh, if Julian and Lines uh, and Wendy are here, uh, and so many of you, I look around, uh, know more about the politics than I do. So there is an ongoing work, struggles at times, to keep the system open, but there's a lot of back and forth. Now, what I like uh, uh, in this regard about Oroville is that there are significantly um, different attitudes about this and that, and that's healthy. 
I mean, it, there's a lot of democracy out there in the north. And with democracy, sometimes comes, it can get, you know, a little bit messy, and there can be real arguments. And in the past, they've come through some of these tough fights when you go way back. Um, and, um, and right now, I feel, um, uh, uh, it's certainly true of Esalen. Esalen is healthier than it's ever been. Um, Good. Uh, and because uh, uh, tonight, there's, uh, there's no hope of getting to first base talking about our uh, pockets, uh, our disabilities at Esalen. It's, it's a vast subject. Uh, but um, we're, um, we're outgrowing uh, a lot of them. We've, uh, but I feel the same thing about Oroville, um, that uh, <clears throat> I'm not close enough to talk with any real authority, but uh, it feels healthier. And um, uh, a lot of the bitterness is gone, I feel. Yeah. <laughs> are, you, are you laughing with, for, or what? <laughs> No. <laughs> what do you think? I mean, I, it, it feels, it feels, at least maybe, uh, are you agreeing or disagreeing? No? Maybe we don't want to talk about that. Um, I just wanted to say maybe that, Mike, I know about uh, your visit to the ashram and the fact that you didn't get along with the mother. Yeah. But I just want to say that all of it is a legacy of how children and mothers works that he used in ways that maybe they had to do the Well, I, I got along with I'm, I'm hoping that the Earth No, what do you mean by that? I, I, no, we can go in many directions. I got, I got along just, with the mother. We've just gone in a direction. <laughs> no. Anyway. Anyway, let's stay with me. There's a lot to talk about. As I was saying. <laughs> Thank you, Bindu. You handled that well. And <laughs> now you're off the hook. Um, yes, I'm drunk. Sorry. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay, Michael. We were, we were talking about leadership, about transmission, about um, sustaining a vision. Um, I often say that whenever there's somebody not too excited about Sri Aurobindo uh, for uh, CIS for some reason, I say, but we were well founded. So here's a question. Uh, in what way, spiritually speaking, does well-founded have a life of its own, or does it have to be uh, reinvented, does it have to be sustained in some way? What? How do you understand that? Like, it was just an ordinary institution, uh, seems to be well-founded doesn't apply. I mean, I think that uh, CIS is a little bit like the United States. It was founded with a mission. Not many countries are founded with a mission. CIS was. It had a mission to yeah. do a certain kind of graduate education. Yeah. So do you think that that is a, is a living spiritual ideal that has a life that is creator in itself or only to the extent that it lives in whoever is running the school at a certain time? Yeah, no, I think it's it, it's real. I mean, I mean let me... It's real. <clears throat> okay, Esalen, uh, we, we got rolling in 62. Right. By 69, there were about 70 to 100 centers modeled on Esalen wow. and uh, around the United States, often with a single name. I mean, the first one, the direct imitation, was called Kairos down uh, in San Diego. Mm -hmm. And uh, so far, and we had a meeting up here at the St. Francis Hotel uh, in both 69 and 70 with representatives, I would say each time of about 70 of these organizations. Right now, there may be four or five left, okay? Wow. Interesting. Yeah, and okay, so the question is why did they fail? And um, uh, first of all, it's a rotten business model. I mean, to um, uh, just, you know, we had the advantage of this property uh, my family owned. We had the uh, first mover advantage, you could say. Um, and we had our commitment. Okay, now we're back to this thing. Um, and then not only did those centers model on Esalen, so many of them failed, but uh, Walt Disney um, actually picked up, partly inspired by Esalen, to build something like it at the Epcot Center in Florida. I mean, you know, one of the big Disneyland things. So they had the same kind of model. You uh, do four or five hundred seminars a year. People come. It's, it's structurally the same. But there, you could come to learn, uh, you know, say to make enchiladas, or you could learn to, you know, tune up your violin playing. Uh, it was uh, open-ended. It was, um, uh, it, it looked a lot 
Well, it didn't work out very well. So a lot of people have asked, okay, what's missing? And I would say it's this secret fire that burned brightly enough at S1, in spite of our wandering, to give it something special. And um, to be really honest, um, uh, there's a side of me that um, at times asks, who's writing the script for this place? <laughs> because things happen coincidentally. They fall into place. We could talk about particular, I mean, I have a lot of stories to tell on that. You do. So I think you lock in to a something, to a real something, that's like a guided angel. Let's call it that. We can use that as a word. It's maybe, or a Dharma field. Uh, oh, that's good. Yeah, okay. So, all right. Um, I think you need language to describe it. Um, for example, we kept saying, Dick and I, that we are our midwives. Uh, I said, um, I want to broker um, a conversation that reaches around the world uh, about like we're having here. It's to broker that conversation and keep the essential elements in play. Okay? And so people as a diverse, so right from the beginning, here comes Aldous Huxley, A. Maslow, Abe Maslow and I became close. He told his daughters I was the son he, he, he never had. Oh. And I was really touched by that. And he, um, that's, that's a whole story. Abe was giving birth to a vision um, that was identical yeah, to ours. He, okay, he started, okay. Uh, this is worth two minutes here. Now, for instance, girlfriend, Dad, I've got to know more. Yeah, I know. So I, see, I keep looking at this thing, because we have to be done at the o'clock. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm in charge of that. Okay. Um, <laughs> anyway, so, um, anyway, um, you know, the third force. Okay. Uh, Human disease psychology. Okay, 1961, 62. That came into birth at the same time as uh, Esther. Right. All right, and then he started transpersonal psychology with Tony Sudi. She asked me to be the... And, and Sam Brown. Uh, yes, uh, Stan, uh, they got the term transpersonal from Stan, and uh, Ken Wilber, and... Um, and Wilber wasn't around. And who? Wilber wasn't around, was he? No. In 1970? No. Oh, yes, he was a young guy, he'd written the spectrum of consciousness. Yes. Uh, yeah, Ken yeah, was, he was in his 20s. Yeah. Yeah, seriously. Yeah. Okay. And, um, yeah. well, anyway, he was, no, he was support, yeah. uh, anyway. But then, but, but, uh, Abe died in 1970. But we were taking a walk here in the streets of San Francisco after he lectured about 68, 69, and he uh, wanted Esalen as part of our publishing series to do his last book, The Further Reaches of Human Nature. And he said, you know, Mike, um, I'm thinking about now the uh, fifth force, see, the fourth force. And um, uh, basically, he wanted to put it in an evolutionary context a la you know, the, this lineage of evolutionary pantheism. Uh, that's where he was going. And um, so, um, uh, okay, coming back to our sense of midwife, I felt with Abe, uh, we were giving him a space to, for his work to dilate. Uh, the same with Ida Rawl. She had trained one person when she came. She, uh, those of you who've been Rawl to know about this thing, um, would be surprised at the degree of occult, um, subtle body phenomena that comes into her. I mean, she was very physical in her description of, you know, separating the, the fascia, the muscles, and I all know, this. I did 15 sessions, I can assure you it's painful. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so she, she gave me 12 or 13. Uh, uh, but in any case, um, but the same you go to um, Moshe Thilgren. I mean, okay, it starts with a series of movements and everything, but what I want to say that in most of the somatic practices, there's a natural entailment of other dimensions of experience that would be uh, where you need this part of uh, integral idea. I mean, you, and they don't want to talk about it often because for a lot of different reasons. So how do you midwife people who want to keep stuff esoteric and back? Now, that's a big issue, but in any case, uh, this idea of, of midwifing something that wants to come into being 
is not in the minds of the people who started the center at Epcot for Disney. <laughs> and, uh, and nor, nor, nor was it in the minds of uh, uh, some large percentage of the people who, who started these growth centers. And, um, uh, and um, so to be open, uh, to have an eye for what was, is coming up over the horizon of practice, and so in that sense, it depends, I think, a lot on what you would have to call connoisseurship, you know. Um, um, that's a big word for me, to be a connoisseur of what it is that's going on, you know. Right. And before you mentioned, uh, a, like, a, a, you say, a silent fire or uh, that is needed to keep the yeah. institution true to its mission. Right. I, I remember, it reminds me of a phrase when you, Asked me to be on the corporation. You wanted some. You wanted five people to be the keeper of the flame. All right. Yeah. And now that is something that Esalen has had because you have been there since '62. But CIS, with seven, maybe eight uh, presidents, uh, doesn't have a keeper of the flame. Okay. Now here's now here's the structure we have. You know there are two kinds of 501c3s in the U.S. Uh, there are a million 501c3s. Uh, there's a lot of suffering today in these, a lot of these centers because since no one owns one of these things, it's a, na a nature of course of vacuum and there needs to be leadership. So people will grab for the tiller, you know, to run the thing. So, um, but uh, there are two kinds of ways they're structured. One is that the boards are self-perpetuating, the board of trustees. The other is the board is elected by the members. Now, the irony, this is an American practice, you can have one member, like Howard Hughes, who was the one member of the Howard Hughes Foundation, <laughs> or you can have uh, a million members, like the Sierra Club. Now, those of you in the Sierra Club know, a lot of time is spent suing other Sierra Club chapters. <laughs> the LA chapter will sue the San Francisco chapter. We'll sue this one. Uh, uh, it, it's a free-for-all. Okay. Esalen now has five members. Okay. And we, I say, we're in that respect like um, Harvard. Because the, you think of the Harvard overseers, who are supposed to be in control, but the Harvard Corporation, which was recently expanded, by the way, it's the first corporation in the United States, 1650. Wow. The first corporation of any type is the Harvard Corporation. Uh, Harvard itself started uh, 13 years earlier, 1637. <clears throat> but this is not generally known. They are the keepers of the flame, supposedly. So our members have only two things they can do. One is elect the trustees. They cannot nominate them. And the other is they're the only ones empowered to rewrite the bylaws. Mm -hmm. But they, their only function is to hold us on Dharma. That's it. All of them connoisseurs of what we're all about. So when I croak, you know, there's four more and so forth to keep this thing going. So, so in other words, you can, I think, build in um, this steersmanship, uh, this connoisseurship. I, I do think, and if uh, for doing what we're wanting to do, I, I think it's uh, crucial. So when, when I'm not on the members any longer, I, a group of people that I called the overboard. But when I was, uh, Don and I had conversations about whether CIS should have a, uh, really? an overboard. Uh, yeah, well. I don't know if it went anywhere, but do you have an opinion about that? I think it's a good idea. You do? I think it'd be a good idea. But uh, I don't know, you know what it would take politically with your board. But, but, but and you, as a structure, you think it's a good idea? It I, seemed to me it was a good idea with respect to Esalen. Okay, but let me, here's the thing. <clears throat> you know, maybe, I, I, okay, it's not so important if you've got a, a symphony, okay? Everyone is in powerful agreement. It was formed to do what? To have symphonies. Okay, for that you need an orchestra, right. et cetera. Okay, the same with universities. The mission is so deeply embedded in the culture. We are in territory now, uh, which is new country, and it is not embedded in the culture. 
it is still something brand new. If you say it's more than a mere institute or a, uh, a mere small college, we're doing something more than the structure. And for that, you need people who are connoisseurs of what this is all about. You see what I'm saying? I do, I do. It, it's hard to do. Yeah, so I would argue, I, uh, this, you just, I, you and I have never talked about this. I, I, I would say, yeah. I think they might, you guys ought to consider that. Okay. Yeah, Don and I discussed it when we were both members. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Glad to have you vote. Okay. Uh, we can either, if you have something important you want no, to say, no, I'm if not, I think we should get questions. Good. If you and I agree, there should be time for Great. Some, Great. Uh, and could somebody take the mic? Yeah, yeah, I have one. Thanks very much. Well, you have one as well. Okay. And. Uh, I would love to hear about CIS, Robert. Sorry, I'm sorry. She would love to hear about CIS. Yeah, about one thing CIS. we haven't had in this conversation is CIS's connection to the 1968 counterculture movement, and anything you want to share about CIS. And the future okay. of CIS. We have had only Mike talk for so long. It's your turn. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, I, was, I was feeling very Mike? deferential. I was feeling very deferential to yeah. Michael. We don't have him here very often, right. and he ain't nobody. Right. So I didn't really want to. <laughs> Um, so how do I think about it, briefly, and in a way that's relevant to the conversation we've had and would have if we did it again, um, is that uh, Hari Das, who is an important member of the uh, San Francisco Renaissance, was a, a person of uh, high culture, deep thinking, spiritual purity, there were no scandals, no, nobody had to apologize for Hari Das at all, and so that is deep, I believe, in our, our history and our mission. So the question I asked you, that you answered I think quite wonderfully, uh, I also I have an opinion of it, which is why I asked you, namely that I think that, a, uh, as I wrote in the, uh, uh, the CIS Today, the, the 50th anniversary issue, um, that most institutions have histories. This institution, because it has a spiritual mission, as a biography. So I see it as a living being. And it has a birth. And it has a, a capacity to develop. It also has the capacity to have its biography <coughs> ended, mm -hmm. distorted and ended. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the mission could be hard to rescue. Um, so that's why I'm always concerned. I'm not, I didn't just get concerned. Uh, you know, this year. I have been concerned every year since I've been here, including years I was president, because a mission is very delicate. And it's subtle. See, it's not like a statement. You must do this. We do have such non-subtle statements about our finances. You have to have so much in reserve. And if you have to have more coming in than going out. These are factual, objective situations. But what counts as the mission? Is India an essential part of the mission? Is Sri Aurobindo, is Haridas Chaudhary an essential part of the mission? If so, what form does that take? And is, is uh, uh, somatics an essential part? Is drama therapy, is integral counseling psychology a program that Haridas founded? Well, I think this is, <coughs> I think it, we're not in danger so long as that conversation is healthy that people have opinions, informed opinions. It is when the mission isn't important enough to be discussed, mm -hmm. then you know the mission is dead. Mm -hmm. When there's passion, when people really care about what integral is, when they really care about, uh, what Mike was talking about uh, with evolution, there's an origin and there's a trajectory, there's a telos. Do we have a telos? Are we trying to do something? We're trying to give something back into the culture. If we have no depth of mission, 
we have nothing to give back. Mm -hmm. And there's really no reason. Right? So we can go out of business financially, but we can also go out of business spiritually. Mm -hmm. See, and that's what I'm hoping will be activated, if I may say, at the risk of embarrassing my good friend, <laughs> by the arrival of Dave. It's already on yeah. encouraged me to be more outspoken than I had been and would have been, mm -hmm. and from an authentic lineage. So we were in Pondicherry for two weeks, uh, talking from morning till night about uh, uh, the ashram, about Oroville, and about California Institute of Medical Studies. And so we're going to write a book on Sri Aurobindo and modern thought. We're going to give a course on Sri Aurobindo. But that's new. It's, it's coming back. But these missions have to be sustained and nurtured and rescued. And, and it's a little bit like craft. I learned this a long time ago uh, from craft work with uh, Ellen, that if a country loses its indigenous craft and the last one dies, it can't be rescued. So we now have a, a, a better link than we've had in, in, in uh, David Shish. And with, I'm joining with him. So the, the, the awareness has been activated. Um, and we do have Michael as a friend, but he's not here. And we had Antaik, who is leaving, retiring. So there's a precious few. I'm looking at Alzac, so I'm so happy to see you here. Uh, so there are people who uh, are not necessarily identified or identifying themselves, but can be called upon. But we have to be alert and active, not aggressively, but respectfully in relation to, to the mission founded by an extraordinary person, our mm -hmm. children, as, mm -hmm. as we both know. So, so I hope that's of some. Yes. 1968 in CRS? Okay, what, it goes what was happening in 1968? Oh, in 1968, <laughs> uh, well, I, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, I, 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 So my dear friend Rick Torrance is an expert on 1968. Many people who spoke here these last few days are experts on 1968. 1968, I was writing my dissertation. Uh, Ellen and I had a, a two-year-old child. Um, uh, I, I was faculty advisor to SDS, but I didn't go to Woodstock. Um, I, I did not yet know about Sri Aurobindo. I found out at Syracuse University in 1969. Then I went to the ashram in 1970. Then I wrote books uh, with Haridas. Um, but I don't think I have anything important to say. What I care about in terms of CIS and, and Haridas is his vision, which I think was inspired. Yeah. And I, when I was president, I did not consider myself a successor to my predecessor. Mm -hmm. I considered myself a little presumptuous, but I no sense lying about it. Consider myself a successor to Haridas children. That's why I came. Yeah. Yay, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you, Robert. Any questions, comments? Mark, I'd love to say something. You were going to say something, no? No, let's, let's get questions. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah, let's do that. Thank you for that. Yeah. Well, I, I'd like to take a stab at Bindu's question about 1968. Go ahead. Yes, you were. Uh, I met Dr. Chowdhury in 1966, two years before. Uh, I became his student. I attended the then American Academy of Asian Studies, and it was on DuBose and Fillmore Street. I studied with Haridas. I studied, uh, of course, Sri Aurobindo, a, a little bit of Buddhism, a, a little bit of Sanskrit. He wasn't teaching Sanskrit. He was teaching the philosophical terms. Um, by 
by 1968, it was really clear that that institution wasn't going to make it. And, and I knew it. That's why uh, those of you who know me know that I went over to Berkeley to study in the criminology department. And, and I left right then because the then uh, American Academy of Asian Studies was folding and it would never get accredited. And that's when Aridesh Chowdhury stepped in, renamed the institution, <coughs> and saved it. Called it the California Institute of Asian Studies. And that was right around 1968. So I consider him, uh, in a way, a small s savior of this whole lineage. Yeah. Okay, great. Do you have anything to say about our present situation? Mike is the chair of the Board Development Committee. He's also a significant donor and a doctoral student writing a dissertation right now. And anything you want to say? The other people would be interested. Uh, I'm, I'm a new board member. Uh, I'm the only board member with a deep, rooted history in, and knowledge of hard discovery and knowledge of this institution and knowledge of, the, of uh, his ashram, the Self-Realization Fellowship. Let me tell you that I was shocked. The first board meeting I went to, I talked about the self, I, I talked about the, the, no, his, his, yeah, cultural, cultural institution okay. fellowship. I talked about that. And significant board members who had been there five, six years looked at me and said, what is that? Oh, right. It was shocking. So, my mission on the board, I'm the root. I may be the only root right now, but I hope you get other roots. Because without roots on the board, and a strong president and provost, rooted and connected, why have CIIS? Why not go down the street to the next college? Well, it's too important to let go. You know, uh, we have that problem with the S on board. Uh, the core of us, about half of us, have yeah, been there all the way back. But um, as new folks come aboard in 57 years, you know, it's, there's no way they can know all of that. So it's a problem. Uh, it's a problem. Do you have a good orientation? Do you, do, do new board members spend a day with you and a few other board members? Here? No, there's, no, we've never uh, regularized it. It's, it. Each one is custom made for each person who comes aboard. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, you, um, I feel that it's a profoundly conservative impulse on our board uh, about letting uh, new folks in. Uh, and it, you know, you and I have talked about there's a lot of energy coming in from these young folks from Silicon Valley right now, <coughs> and um, it's uh, a lot of new energy and uh, new money and uh, um, engineering perspectives, yeah. uh, which um, and not much knowledge of. The humanities in general. Yeah. But you at least have the knowledge. Well, no, it's, but, but I, I'm just saying it's a, it's a problem. Like Mike was saying, uh, the, the disconnect between the, the saying, you've never heard of this, you never heard of that. So it's getting to know each other. And, um, you know, it's like our jazz band, you know, some of them are used to different music and uh, trying to get us all, you know, being a working group. And, uh, <clears throat> It's gotten uh, healthier than ever lately in terms of uh, resonance with differences. But, um, you know, when you get um, strong characters, you know, this can get, it can get feisty. <laughs> yeah. At least it's alive. So it's alive, yeah. I, 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 I can remember a conversation with faculty members who come to me and say, do I have to be, sorry, Thank you very much. Do I have to be interested in Sri Aurobindo? Do I have to be interested in spirituality? Right? And my answer has always been, you don't have to subscribe to a particular view, but you have to be interested in that dimension of human experience. There's no one answer, but you have to have an answer, or else you're in the wrong school, you should go to Golden Gate. <laughs>
Thank you. Great. I'm not saying everybody agrees with that, but that's what I. That was my answer. That's a good answer. I'm just curious how you're qualifying the health of Esalen. Like you're saying it's healthier than ever, so I'm curious how you're qualifying the health. Yeah, well, you, you'd have to be acquainted with our our disabilities. <laughs> um, we, um, uh, and this has been, a lot of it has been written about, so I, I'm not talking, you know. Big books on Esalen. Well, you, you know, for example, I mean, a lot of the um, inbuilt um, attitudes uh, from particular practices, particularly Gestalt practice as formed by Fritz Perls. And um, a lot of those attitudes are, are kind of carried on in the language. And some of it is, um, um, it gets really corny at times, you know. Uh, no more buts, and, always and, no buts. Now, this was uh, a big deal for us in the 60s, and. You know, because but is a qualification of cutting off of something. Well, now 40 years later, the few people left, it's kind of like, um, you know, it, it, it's like something from another century. <laughs> it's uh, because a lot of it is not, it's not, it's a little a doctrinaire and cultish, frankly, some of those. And then, um, um, okay, a huge premium. Uh, in early Esalen on catharsis. And um, so people who live for catharsis, catharsis uh, can be a byproduct, as Aristotle described, you know, of drama that is purging, cleansing, opening, everything. Um, but when you systematize it and do it, let's say, three times a week, <laughs> you become like what Carl Rogers said, a therapeutic professional as a patient. You become a professional patient. And then with, with that, often there is a fixation on kind of a quasi-Freudian working on your mother problem <laughs> for decades. And out of a kind of victim mentality where they can sneak in. And this, the cult of victimhood, which is abroad in America today, and it's a fallout from this therapeutic term, I mean, life as therapy, mm -hmm. finally it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Therapy should be part of, and um, uh, part, it, it, so many uh, things we do in life are naturally therapeutic. So that, that look, these fixations are giving way as people get older and, uh, uh, you know, well, we get younger and a lot of it goes away naturally. But a lot of it has been discredited, too. I mean, for example, our president is Gordon Wheeler, and he was chosen by the American Psychological Association, APA, to write a, their, their latest standard description of what is Gestalt therapy, uh, because he's been a leader of the, um, uh, the, the flow of Gestalt therapy into object relations therapy, into all sorts of relationship therapies of various kinds, and uh, Fritz, put a tremendous premium uh, on the problems that people were having then in rebelling against the constrictions of everybody's parents in the 50s. Don't say the word cancer. You can't say that. Uh, none of these sex issues that are today, I mean, watching, um, I won't elaborate, but then the recent <laughs> hearings, the recent hearings, um, you know, on this, uh, with our uh, Kavanaugh, I mean, oh my God, to my parents, I can't imagine them listening to the things that were said in the halls of Congress. This is a huge shift in the culture. Uh, so anyway, Fritz was out of that. So it's not, uh, anyway, there's revision going on um, in the, um, I like to talk about what's the portfolio of virtues that are smuggled in with every practice. It's often not talked about. You know, um, Fritz uh, would talk, you know, a lot of this stuff sounds better in German. Authentic, <laughs> authenticity. <laughs> Dasein. I mean, you took it in German. <laughs> it's, it's, like, it's like this language about enlightenment, you know. And we often do a drill in Esalen that we get, uh, everybody says, what's your definition of enlightenment? You learn that this is a word looking for a cast of characters. This is, a, this is a word floating around looking for. It's like our integral. 
Well, yeah, yes, yeah, 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 everyone's subject to this too. But anyway, so this portfolio of virtues and right in the future of the body, I realized if you analyze, for example, Fritz was incredible on um, um, bravery, yeah. um, entrepreneurship, um, awareness, but he wasn't very good on kindness. And if you said manners, he said, I spit on your manners. <laughs> that was his standard line. And why? I mean, you know, a lot of us grew up with manners to a fault, and pretty soon, you know, it was either you build armor, you know, a right in sense of inhibiting behaviors that are unnecessary. And um, in any case, you can go through every single leader that's ever come to us and I done this exercise again and again. What are, the, what are the virtues that you prize? Let's talk about them. And not smuggle them in as a new set of shoulds. You know, it's, but it's hidden away. So that uh, essence got to update, broaden, make more sophisticated uh, what virtues we, we honor, which attributes in ourselves. And uh, cults tighten up around the way you talk and the way you act and the angle of your eyeballs to show <laughs> how angled up toward the light you are. A little bit different, Michael, because your people, our people go home. And they only come once in a while. Once yeah. or twice a week. Yeah. Very different. Yeah, I'm, very I'm different. going to take it, stock here. Okay. Um, so uh, we have permission from David Sheesh to go a little over, but I would like to recommend that we only go over for any topics, or questions, or comments that you consider to be really important, such that you would be very disappointed if you didn't say what it is that's on your mind and your heart, that's CIS language. Um, and I am particularly interested in looking at a few people to see if there's anything that we missed that should be included even however briefly. And uh, Dave Sheesh or, or Mike or Liz uh, or Michael, anything that you wish like uh, Bindu did to me before, I would have felt terrible in the morning if I, well, I forgot to talk about 1968. <laughs> so anything like that that we should um, uh, we should do because we, we will end pretty soon. Uh, Mike is going to make uh, some comments, uh, but brief. And uh, so we have a little time for something that um, you know has some uh, uh, urgency or um, sort of energy behind it. Liz, please. Okay, um, it may not be of the urgency you're speaking of, but looking at these three institutions coming out of a common stream with a common mission, maybe. It's an incredibly difficult thing to land this within the constraints of a university. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering what, the, I have my own theory as to what Chowdhury maybe wanted to happen as a result of that. But I think we live with that tension every day and I'm just wondering what the goal was, why? Why are we trying to do this? Why, why, you know, if I compare Esalen and the freedom, I know you've had your own issues, but there's a very different freedom of practice mm -hmm. and maybe of being able to follow a single path a little more easily. A university is going to have a lot of constraints. Yeah, and, and in my opinion, uh, Esalen and Oroville are more similar mm -hmm. yeah. than yes. either is to CIIS because we are responsible to the federal government, mm -hmm. to the accrediting agency, mm -hmm. and if we don't do what the requirements, our students cannot get federal loans. And if they can't get federal loans, they can't do a master's or a doctorate very often. Most students cannot. So that's a huge obligation. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of the controversies we had in the 90s was due to the fact that Esalen got, <coughs> sorry, the uh, WASC, the accrediting agency, came after two weeks after I arrived, and there were nine standards, and we failed eight and a half. Oh. So for the next 10 years, we were racing to pass those standards. Now we've uh, we've had a really good run of passing all the standards. We hit a bump two years ago. <coughs> Clearly, we're on the way back. But you can't fail to pass those standards. You won't get financial aid, 
and your students who come, and you will be out of business. And three or maybe four of our primary competitors are out, have either completely out of business or have given up their mission. We're, you can almost say with, you can include Pacifica, uh, but in the, Bay, in the Bay Area, Northern California, we are the only tree standing. And that is because, I would say, mostly because Lawrence Rockefeller enabled us to lift the school well enough that we could then attract better faculty, better staff, better administration, computers, library, and improve the building, and many other things. Now, since then, we've been trying to raise money for many more donors. You don't get a donor like Lawrence very often. <coughs> but it is very restricted in terms of we can't just decide, you know, to teach in a way that's contrary to our mission. Because mm -hmm. when the creditors come, they read our mission and they and say, wait a minute, you're, you're supposed to be teaching psychology over here, and all you're doing is such, such and such and such and such. We need to hear why you're doing that. And then you're you know, on the defensive. So it's entirely different. I mean, Esalen and uh, Auroville can, uh, See, as you said before, what is what is trying to arise spiritually as well as other ways. But the other ways can be a subset of the spiritual. In our in an academic institution, our spiritual has to be, in terms of the accreditation, has to be a subset of our academic respectability. Yeah. It is it is not front and center doesn't have to be hidden, but it can't be in charge. Finances and academic legitimacy by <coughs> standard academic standards are absolutely required. If not, we're out of business. So the stakes are very high there, and you need an administration, especially a president, who knows all those rules and knows how to get an institution to meet those requirements. That is the number one job, to raise the money, and to make sure that it meets the academic standards that live in a dot in a culture, live in the academic world with the dominant culture. And the dominant culture is not spiritual. It's <laughs> flatland. That's a big tension and not going to go away. You know, it's well, to say that though, <laughs> with, you know, within our <laughs> fellowship of organizations. <coughs> I say. Yes. Uh, within this, um, there, um, you know, are, are, are different missions that can, can do. I mean, you are generating hundreds of uh, graduate degrees uh, for people to go out and teach. Esalen is not. Uh, we uh, do <clears throat> have, um, I would say, some percentage. I don't know what it is right now. Maybe twenty percent of our. We do five hundred seminars on the public side of our program that people can get for their licensing and renewal of the licensing, social workers, uh, nurses. Um, uh, at times we've, been, we've had different relations with the, uh, uh, with the AMA, with the Medical Association. And um, so, uh, but in other words, we're set up to do different tasks within our shared Dharma stream. Indeed we are. You may say. David, you're going to, probably the last comment. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I was just told that uh, the institute is going to close in 10 minutes. <laughs> but, uh, oh, oh, oh. Yeah. Actually, I doubt that, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> we, may, we may try to be gone in 10 minutes, but we won't be. <laughs> I, I, I just wanted to follow up on what we were doing, what the two of you were discussing regarding uh, creating people with degrees for the future. Because I think they really promote scholarship. It's, it's with uh, the creation of the right kinds of scholars mm -hmm. that we perpetuate a certain field. And I think uh, perhaps one thing we should think about, and I, I really like Mike's term about panentheistic spirituality, because we can't today make it look like a cult that teaches Sri Aurobindo. We have to teach the broad field in which he's included. So the question is, are we actually preparing a field in which scholars of this kind can emerge? And I'd say we still have some way to go to do that. 
that, that's one way of ensuring our legacy, I think. Uh, are we putting attention into that? that that's a question. Okay. Mike Evil. Yes. Would you like to make some closing comments? I do. As well 
was the administrative staff of East West Psychology Department for putting this inspiring conference together and also for serving as his gracious host during these three days. this conference will continue to serve, on a limb, will continue to serve as a reference point when CIIS celebrates its 100th year in 2068. A special thanks to Ramsey Kanar, Kanan, Randa Kanan, a publisher of uh, PM Press for making available a wide variety of books related to CIS, as well as our friends from uh, Oroville who have made their books available. Thank you, our audience, for being with us for the past three days. Your questions and comments played an immeasurable part in this conference success. For we have, together, with the presence of our Oroville guests, Oroville guests, and now with Michael Murphy from Esalen, again, nourish the roots of CIIS, and that without these roots, our institution loses its meaning and purpose. Om Shanti Shanti, peace love. May the divine impulse toward the integral and towards the transformation of consciousness continue unabated. Yes. Thank you all. Yes.